parts of Gospel of John or a part of the Gospel of John. Um, I thought I was going to bounce off my chair at one point <laughs> as we compared it to Moses and Exodus. And um, because it's so rich, God's Word is, is so wonderful, and I hope it gets a hold of every single one of our hearts. So praise the Lord. We are um, in the book of Revelation, and I need to turn this on. So this is um, George's little, we used to use this all the time, and, and George is going to be able to bring this home for um, Victoria so she can hear today's message as well. We're going to be doing this every week for her, like we used to do um, before. So um, <laughs> we're going to do it again. So I know Marilyn really appreciated it, and I, I'm quite sure Victoria will as well. Okay, praise the Lord. We are in the book of Revelation. Once again, I, I have to admit, as I'm preparing Revelation, we're in chapter 14, by the way, as I've been preparing and meditating on it, I, I, I'll struggle a little bit with the whole, the application part. And um, I think application of Scripture is important. You know, knowing um, how this leads us and guides us in our path, how we live our lives. But there are certain things, uh, I was thinking even this morning a little bit, that um, don't need a lot of explanation for application. And I was thinking, what, what would it be like for you and me if, if all of a sudden the Lord were at our side he put his arm over our shoulders and told us that he had uh, showed us his hands, perhaps, and reminded us of how he died for us, was raised to life, how he has gone ahead of us to prepare a place in his Father's kingdom, as it says in his word. He goes, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. I mean, to have him speak to your heart and say, I have prepared a place for you, and it's my Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, and for him to tell you that there's this eternal kingdom that awaits you, and an eternal inheritance, that's what his word says. Your heart would be greatly comforted, and as his arm slips down and he begins to walk away, I don't think the first thought that would come to your mind is, <clears throat> excuse me, um, how do I apply that to my life? <laughs> you know? Um, there, there's times when that's necessary, but also, oftentimes the Word of God is just, it's just so wonderful, you don't really need that kind of a, an explanation. And I think the book of Revelation is one of those kind of books. It's not a how-to book at all. It's not a, um, I mean, it, it gives us a lot of directions in how we're to live in the fear of the Lord and to worship and praise Him. But God is opening up for us, if you will, the future and the heavens as we get a glimpse of the triumph of Jesus Christ. In, in the Gospels, we see Him on the cross and then resurrected. In Revelation, we see Him seated in His kingdom in glory showing his saints who were redeemed on the at the cross, celebrating his triumph with him. And I think we're going to get a glimpse of that today. So I don't, I don't, I, I guess I'm saying this more for myself than anybody else. That, um, it's, it's not always, um, there's not always a, a clear cut way that you can, you know, bring down, bring out the application or, or quote, make it practical or, or whatever. But the picture you get, the truths that just come off the pages of Scripture are all the explanation that we really need. Let's look at the first five verses of chapter 14. The context, once again, is this um, interlude, this parenthetical section starting in chapter 12 through chapter 15 is as um, we're being prepared for the final set of judgments 
in this section, we are having seven different personages revealed to us. At first we had seven seals, and then there were seven, um, um, excuse me, um, trumpets, and then seven thunders, and then seven personages revealed. And um, here we're going to see the lamb as we saw him earlier in triumph with 144,000. So the context is this, and we just came off of chapter 13 where we see two different beasts. We see the, the political beast and we see the spiritual beast uh, called the Antichrist and false prophet, deceiving, powerful, everything the world admires in a sense with its definition of spirituality and its idea of power and the solution to man's problems. But Jesus Christ has a very different solution, doesn't he? That's why it's a tragedy when the church tries to take up the methods of the world to, to take care of human problems. It just, it's so um, counterintuitive to the scripture. Jesus Christ has come to rescue us out of death and to bring us into the life of his own and his kingdom. So these first five verses, uh, John the Apostle says, Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his father's name and his, uh, who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. And in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. Praise God. Mount Zion. Um, it says, then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000. This is uh, most likely the heavenly Mount Zion. We, we get glimpses of that in Scripture. One of them is back in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. Um, actually, to bring that into context, I'll read a couple of verses before that and after. In Hebrews chapter 12, the apostle says, For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg, that no further message be spoken to them. Of course, that's Mount Sinai at the giving of the Ten Commandments. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks better a better word than the blood of Abel. You have come, he says, to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. The apostles trying to rem remind these Jewish converts that, you know, 
You've got, don't, don't ever think of going back. You've got something so much greater. Not just an earthly Zion in Jerusalem, but the new Zion, the heavenly Zion, where all of the redeemed, Old and New Testament, join together as one people of God, where they are with the Lamb, following the Lamb. You've got something so much greater. And if you remember from Psalm 2, one of the early predictions or prophecies, I should say, of the coming of Jesus Christ as a king. It says in Psalm 2, verse 6, as for me, it's God speaking, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. And of course, in the immediate context for Israel, they knew that the king in Jerusalem was the co-regent with God, that God would reign through that king. God had set his king upon Zion. But we know that ultimately Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, and he's the one who will reign as king forever and ever on the new Mount Zion in the new Jerusalem with all the redeemed of the Lord. Praise God. It's amazing how all the scriptures just interconnect and interpret each other and make things so clear for us. So Jesus Christ fulfills Psalm 26, the ultimate fulfillment. He's the lamb standing in glory on God's holy hill in heaven, accompanied by his army. The sound of their harps and voices descends from heaven. And I, I like the, the language that's used here, like a roar, a great roar, and the sound of loud thunder. Can you imagine what that's going to be like with the celebration before the throne of God? And look at that celebration. There's loud roar. And, and um, the note here says that, there, um, that it sounded like, a, like waterfalls, just thundering cascades. And as they sing before the throne, the four living creatures and the elders. I think it is interesting that once again, the elders uh, and the living creatures are distinct from the redeemed of the Lord. The seal on their foreheads is the name of the Lamb and of the Father. Do you remember back in chapter 7 when we come across the 144,000 initially that um, they were sealed on their foreheads for protection? It says, after this I saw, this is chapter 7. You can go back there if you want or just listen. After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth or, on, or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God. And he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. And it gives the tribes and saying 12,000 from each tribe were sealed. And so sealed, and now we see them before the throne of God. God the message we see there is that God is well able to protect his own and that we now see them in the heavenly Jerusalem in the midst of all the turmoil in evil of this present world and of the tribulation period in particular, that God is able to bring people safely through. Praise God. There are two different views, once again, as to who these 144,000 are. Well, there's probably many views. There's cultic views as well. And um, it seems, it seems to me that it's a particular group of the redeemed because they're called the first fruits unto the Lord, implying more to come. And, um, and we see from chapter 7 that they very well may be God accomplishing his purpose of 
that he promised, and we see it in Romans 11, of God redeeming Israel. There are others who see that, that, that it's just a representative group of all the redeemed of the Lord. However you see that, the message is, is very powerful, that those whom the Lord claims and those whom he seals, he's able to bring safely through to the heavenly home. And that's what we need to see. Because the scripture is very clear that in, in Ephesians chapter 1, that we've been sealed by the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of our future inheritance. It's a seal that cannot be broken. God's promise that he will bring us safely home and fully participate in the triumph of the Lamb over all of the powers of hell and darkness and over all the power of sin. Jesus Christ has overcome. He has triumphed over all. He is the conqueror and we share in that triumph and he is able to bring us safely to the place of full and complete redemption. The redemption that God has started in us will be completed. We died in our union with Christ. We died with him on the cross. In our union with Christ, Paul says, Romans chapter 6, we were also raised with him. And in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, we've been made to be seated with him in heavenly places. And as I said last week, our lives have been hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, we shall also appear with him in glory. So those who partake in his death, those who partake in his resurrection in their union with Christ by faith in Christ, fully partake in all of his redemption, the good work that he started in us, he will complete in us. Those who are born again, regenerate by faith in Jesus Christ and the work, the sovereign work of the Holy Spirit, those are sealed unto the day of redemption. We will be with him in his heavenly Jerusalem on Mount Zion. The question becomes, are we saved? <laughs> are we born again? And having been reading in the last couple of weeks the writings from the um, 17th century um, scholar Abrakel, he had often exhorted his people to make sure, like Peter the Apostle says, to check your heart and to affirm for yourself that you are indeed in the faith. And there's certainly many indicators of that, and one of them is the sense of joy and rejoicing we have in Jesus Christ and in the gospel, his gospel message. And Jesus gives the biggest indication of all, as does the Apostle John, of testing yourself as to whether you're in the faith. Jesus Christ says on that day, on that judgment day, he will say to some, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. As a people who have a life, a mindset, and a lifestyle of sin. You can say, hey, I believe in all this Jesus stuff, but your life has never been changed. You continue to live in the same patterns of sin. And not just falling into the same, I mean, none of us are perfect, we, all, well, we commit sins throughout our lives. John the Apostle says, I, I write these things to you that you would not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So it's, it's, it, forgiveness is an ongoing thing we receive from the Lord. And um, none of us are perfect, but the lifestyle, what is the direction of your entire life? Jesus called them workers of iniquity. They may have claimed his name, but they, their hearts were never regenerated. And John the Apostle says, he who says I've come to know him, and this is in chapter 2 of 1 John, he who says I've come to know him, but does not keep his word, is a liar and the truth is not in him. Doesn't mean perfect obedience, but it means once again, the direction of your life has changed. That's what repentance is all about. The direction of your life changes. And if you're, if you're one who has had an about face, we could say it that way, imperfect though we are, and we've put our faith in Jesus Christ and we're born again, we've been sealed in the Holy Spirit, 
and that eternal redemption, the completed redemption, is a sure promise that cannot fail. Praise God. You know, that's good news. That is good news. So um, in Revelation 14, verse 3, he says, And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. I want to go back to that in a few moments because I want to bring this to conclusion with the whole idea of singing a song of celebration. It's wonderful to see in Revelation all this singing and all this celebration when you see the heavenly scenes. You see the groaning and the agony on earth as people are judged for their rejection of God. But in heaven, for those redeemed by the Lamb, you see celebration and singing. So, um, no, in verse 3, it also says they were redeemed from the earth. And then it goes on to say they were redeemed from among mankind. And, and what's, what's the difference between having been redeemed from the earth and having been redeemed from among mankind? Well, I think the part uh, where it says redeemed from mankind is, is pretty clear in Scripture. Like the, the song says, from heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride, and with his blood he bought her, and for her life he died. Jesus Christ came into the world to call out from among the nations a people for himself, and he died for his bride. And, um, and we know that he has come to seek her out and to save her. So saved from among mankind, we understand that. But what about from the earth? Some suggest it's because they have now are before the throne of God and they've been literally delivered from this earth. That may very well be the plainest meaning. meaning. But when I think of earth, I think of all of the, um, the ramifications of being earth dwellers. And we see earth dwellers mentioned often in the book of Revelation as those who are stuck to the earth and have no heavenly perspective. We, um, in the book of Ecclesiastes, we see that we are to be a conscious of the heavenly realities if you're ever going to have any kind of peace of mind living in the routine of life and the futility of life and and i was you know if you, if you read genesis and you see after man's fall that every the earth is mentioned over and over again that adam is to go out and he's to till the earth and to work the ground and it would bring up thorns and thistles it's you know ever since the fall of man we're consistently pulled earthward. Did you, ever, did you ever notice how you can have a moment when you um, experience perhaps the Lord's presence or you have a moment when he speaks you through his word and your soul is elated and then a half hour later you feel depressed and wonder why you're alive? You know, I mean, it doesn't take long for us and our spiritual set of mind to just be pulled down again. That's why, that's why, people, it's so important for every one of us to have that time in prayer, to have time in the reading of God's word, because we constantly have to be lifted up, don't we? Constantly. We're just drawn to the earth and to the ground in our daily routines, in the mundane things of life. And um, we need those times of refreshing and, and spending time in God's word and in prayer and in fellowship with other Christians just to be lifted again. That's why the midweek Bible study, I think, is so important in many, many churches because, you know, it's hard to survive. I remember our friend Dolly used to say, I can't survive an entire week. I need something in the middle of the week, you know, that will just help build me up. So I think perhaps when it says they were redeemed from the earth, praise God, they're redeemed from the futility we see in Ecclesiastes. You know, they're redeemed from this being pulled to the ground. They are forever free in the presence of the Lord and in his immediate presence. So maybe it's a combination of those two ideas. Redeemed out of this earth and away from its suffering, but redeemed from this earthly perspective. Redeemed from the earth and now fully heavenly minded. 
with the mind of Christ and singing the new song of redemption to the Lord. It's a wonderful thought, isn't it? Finally free. Total fulfillment. The weight is gone. It says in Hebrews that, to, to, that, that sin, that sin that so easily entangles or ensnares us. And, you know, there won't be that anymore. No entanglement of sin. No more corruption. Nothing ever again to pull us down. Not even Satan's temptations. He's gone. He's away. <laughs> He's not there. Praise God. I don't know about you, but that's, that's exciting. And that's our good news. That Christ has accomplished that for us. It says in verses 4 and 5 that they did not defile themselves with women, for they are virgins. That's probably been the most uh, uh, puzzling verse for many people and in this chapter. Um, what does that mean? Does it mean they were celibate? And uh, the answer to that is no, it doesn't mean they were celibate necessarily at all. Um, first of all, if, if it had reference to being celibate, it would not have said they defiled themselves with women. Because in the sexual relationship between a married man and a married woman, there's nothing defiling at all. It's beautiful and it's perfect. It's the way God created it to be. Okay, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing and it should be a celebration between a husband and a wife. It's um, interestingly, in the Old Testament, um, in particular in Deuteronomy chapter 23, if you want to write it down, verses 9 to 11, those who were to serve in the army of the Lord to go off to battle would have to keep themselves undefiled by many things, but also keep themselves from any sexual union with their wives for the period of time that they were in battle. It's, it has the idea of being totally separated to the Lord for his service and in battle. But also we see a theme that runs in the Old Testament and we see it here in the book of Revelation as well. We see idolatry is always associated somehow with, uh, with um, adultery and fornication and prostitution. And we see a spiritual, a spiritual prostitution in the scripture, a spiritual adultery in the scriptures. And this group, these, this group of people, they are blameless before the throne of God. They follow the lamb wherever he goes and they have not defiled themselves with the idolatry of the world. That's the main reference or to any kind of spiritual adultery at all. They're single hearted and they're not guilty of idolatry. And it's interesting because we just came out of a chapter where you see blatant idolatry under this second beast, the false prophet. But this is a group sealed by the Lord, kept blameless for the Lord before the throne of God. In their mouths there was no falsehood, no lie to be found in their mouths. They resembled Jesus, <laughs> don't they? They're blameless. They're blameless as the servant of the Lord. Interestingly, in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 9, I'll read that verse for you. It says of Jesus Christ, this is the servant chapter of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus, the gospel proclaimed 700 years before Jesus came, it says, and they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. They put him to death even though he had never done any violence or had never spoken any deceit at all. We get the idea that this group, this 144,000, also suffered persecution. And some, some scholars contend perhaps martyrdom, but they had also done no violence, nor was any deceit in their mouths. They're like Jesus. They follow Jesus wherever he goes, and um, which is true discipleship. 
They're the first fruits for God and for the Lamb. I like that word blameless. And Colossians is the, um, I'd like to turn to Colossians just for a moment and then we will, I'll bring this to a conclusion. Colossians uses the word blameless as well. Paul in his letter to the Colossians. I remember when the, when the lights went on for the first time inside of me about this verse in Colossians, how exciting that was. <laughs> it, it, it just it says so much about how complete the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is. We have no idea what sin or sinful man looks like through God's eyes. And I really believe that in his mercy, God has preserved us from that. We have no idea how polluted humankind really is apart from God's sovereign grace. We have no idea. We, we do, as we grow in Christ, learn more and more and come to a greater understanding of how dangerous sin is and how wrong it is and how God is displeased with sin. But he has protected us, I believe, from seeing how bad sin really, really is. I think when we look at the brutalized body of Jesus Christ shamed on the cross, so much so that he didn't even look like a man, we get a little bit of an idea of what sin looks like in the eyes of God. Because not only does he demonstrate um, God's love for us in that sacrifice, but he also demonstrates our helplessness and our sinfulness in saving ourselves. So we get a little bit of an idea but this is what the scripture says, starting with verse 19. It says, for by him, excuse me, let me get down to verse 19. For in him all the fullness of God is pleased to dwell, referring to Jesus Christ. And through him to reconcile all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace. This is reconciliation with God, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, you believers in Colossae, and you who once were alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in, the body of, in his body of flesh by his death. He's reconciled you by his body of flesh by his death. Now watch this. In order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. So otherwise, the, com the sacrifice of Jesus Christ was so complete. It was so complete that in the eyes of the infinitely holy, almighty, eternal God, as he gazes at you, when you stand before his presence someday, and even positionally now, he sees that you are holy, blameless, and above reproach. Wow. God wouldn't miss us if, if the entire universe were perfectly holy, every ounce of this universe, every part of it, but somewhere there was a microscopic little speck of rebellion, God's eye would catch it. And he would hate it and want to obliterate it. But when you and I stand before the throne of God, because of Jesus Christ and our union with him, his sacrifice was so complete that he won't even find a speck. We will be blameless, and God will see us as holy. Wow, that's amazing. That's the blood of Jesus. That's the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Praise God. That is so powerful. With the idea of the new song that they sang before the Lord, interestingly, Throughout Scripture, and this is going to be my closing point. Throughout Scripture, we see um, songs being sung in celebration of God's great redemption. That is why at the beginning of the service, 
I started us with Exodus chapter 15 because of the great redemption the Jews had experienced and they celebrate in song. I, I put a quote, uh, just one stanza from a song it's by Robert Lowry called, How Can I Keep From Singing? I don't know if you've ever heard of this one. You, oh, you have? Oh, I figured Tim probably did, you know. <laughs> but this one stanza says, and listen to these words, they're beautiful. My life flows on in endless song above earth's lamentation. I hear the real, though far off hymn that hails a new creation. No storm can shake my inmost calm while to that rock I'm clinging. Since Christ is Lord of heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? Isn't that beautiful? Praise God. So throughout scripture, many times, in the Psalms you see in particular, when there's great redemption or a great um, um, victory in battle, the, the Jewish people, the people of God would celebrate in song. And we see it here in chapter 14. We saw it, we saw it even in chapter 5 of Revelation and, and uh, singing before the Lord of the great redemption of God for his people. In chapter 15, we will see it again when we get there. And I just, I'm going to close with a quote from this Bible that I have to open backwards. Um, <laughs> this is a, um, a Jewish Torah, and it's literally a um, translation done by Jewish people. No Christians were involved in this translation process at all. And the notes that are in here are rabbinic notes, notes from their traditions and from their rabbis. And um, I'm going to read one note in here. I find will be a tremendous blessing to you. Let me just get to the page. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> the music stand wants to go down. It kind of goes backwards, so you know. <laughs> it's got the Hebrew and the English in it. It's called the Song by the Sea, and it's the note, the rabbinic note that they have right with Exodus 15 that we read this morning. This was written by a Jewish rabbi, okay? And it's, it's amazing, the spiritual insight that he has here. In the Torah's definition, a song is a profound and unusual spiritual phenomenon. According to, and he mentions a, another rabbi's name, there were only 10 songs from the beginning of creation to the end of the scriptural period. Even the sublime poetry of David and Isaiah, as well as that of the other prophets, is not among the ten songs. What then constitutes the Torah's concept of song? In the normal course of events, we fail to perceive the hand of God at work. And we often wonder how most of the daily, seemingly unrelated phenomena surrounding us could be part of a divine, coherent plan. Isn't that true? <laughs> we fail to see how all of this unrelated phenomena surrounding us could be a part of a divine, coherent plan. We see suffering and evil. And we wonder how they can be the handiwork of a merciful God. Okay. Rarely, however, very rarely, there is a flash of insight that makes people realize how all the pieces of the puzzle fall into place. At such times, we can understand how every note, instrument, and participant and God's symphony of creation plays its role. The result is a song. For the Torah's concept of song is the condition in which all the apparently unrelated and contradictory phenomena do indeed meld into a coherent 
merciful, comprehensible whole. At the sea, Moses and the Jewish people understood their situation as never before. The suffering of the Egyptian exile, the deception that led Pharaoh to pursue them, the hopelessness that they had felt when they were surrounded by Pharaoh, the sea, and the wilderness, the demands from many of their own number that they return to slavery, even Moses' old recrimination that his arrival in Egypt to carry out God's mission had only made things worse for Israel. Such doubts and fears disappeared when the sea split. And as the sages teach, even a simple maidservant at the sea perceived a higher degree of revelation than that of the prophet Ezekiel in his heavenly vision described in Ezekiel chapter 1. To the Jews at sea, creation became a symphony, a song, because they understood how every unrelated and incomprehensible event was part of the harmonious score that led up to that greatest of all miracles. Once they attained that realization, they also became convinced that all the myriad events of the past and future that they still did not know or comprehend were part of God's plan as well. Because they believed, as the verse before the song tells us, they could only but sing. Praise God. Isn't that powerful? Life is so much like that. It's just like, God, I don't get it. But there's, there's moments when our eyes are open. The cross of Jesus Christ and his resurrection is one such moment. Someday before the throne, all of us will blend together in song, perfect and complete song, because then we'll understand how all creation actually is a perfect symphony. Everyone playing their part. God always in control and to be glorified. Praise the Lord. That was written by a rabbi. Wasn't that wonderful? Praise God. And um, we're going to have our communion celebration. I think communion is one of those ways that, in a sense, we sing a song. We, we celebrate. We recognize. We remember. Like the Passover for the Jews, they remembered that great redemptive event when their lives were spared while judgment went throughout Egypt. And we're reminded in Revelation that we, our lives are sp spared by the blood of Christ and, um, and that we are sealed in the Holy Spirit and we will never suffer God's judgment. And this communion is our celebration of this great redemptive event when all creation sings together at the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ and at his exaltation. I wonder what that moment was like when Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father and was exalted as Lord and King over all of creation. What was that moment like in heaven? What kind of a song was bellowed out <laughs> at that moment in our communion we celebrate that sacrifice and exaltation. Praise 